Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. Today, in honor of Nonfiction November, I wanted to talk to you about one of my favorite nonfiction writers, and that is Joan Didion. Joan Didion has written some fiction, but I haven't read any of her fiction. I've only read her nonfiction, and so that's what I want to focus on today. Just to give you some quick background on Joan Didion, she first gained prominence as a writer in the 1960s. Much of her work is comprised of essays and long-form pieces that utilize the techniques of literary journalism and narrative nonfiction. She became a prominent voice of the 1960s and 1970s, and in that way she's really been considered a historian of her own era and her own generation. More recently she's written some works of personal memoir that have defined the latter part of her career. Many of her essays and nonfiction and memoirs contain a quality of investigation. They're very probing and they feature her kind of working her way through facts and information and trying trying to form some sort of cohesive narrative out of them. I've read five of Joan Didion's nonfiction books, and I want to go through each of them in chronological order so you can get to know her work a little bit. The book that really put Joan Didion on the map is her 1968 collection of essays, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, and this is a book that critics have called an essential portrait of America, and California specifically, in the 1960s. The first half of this book is comprised of long-form journalistic pieces, including the title essay Slouching Towards Bethlehem, which focuses on the counterculture in San Francisco in the 1960s. But I have to say, I think the best part of this book is the second half of it, which is comprised of much more personal essays, including Goodbye to All That, which chronicles her departure from New York City after living there for several years. And it certainly is an essay that's about New York, but it's also about her kind of reaching the end of her 20s, realizing that her youth in many ways is over and kind of reckoning with that. The White Album features more essays about the 1960s in America, particularly the late 1960s and the early 1970s, and a lot of these essays involve Joan Didion looking back on that time period and the disorienting and tumultuous quality of it. Joan Didion is really parsing her thoughts about storytelling and the purpose of storytelling and the ways that we try and fit narratives onto particular time periods in order to make sense out of them. And a lot of the tension in this book is her inability to form a sensible narrative about the late 60s and early 70s in America because it was such a sort of uncohesive time. And I think that this is maybe one of my least favorite Joan Didion books just because it does feel very disjointed and the different essays feel kind of disconnected. But I do think that's part of the point, and I think it's a really interesting portrait of that time period and that specific era. It's so specific to that time that I think it's worth a read because of that. Then we have Where I Was From, which is Joan Didion's book about California, which seems like a strange thing to say because really every Joan Didion book is about California in some way. But this book is really about her family history in California and her personal relationship with California mythology and the idea of California. Her family made the sort of much mythologized western crossing in the 1840s and even according to family lore traveled for a time with the Donner Party before their paths sort of fatefully diverged. Those are the stories that Joan Didion was steeped in when she was growing up in the Sacramento Valley. But then as an older person she starts to dig into those ideas and to dig into and undermine that mythology so this book is part history, part journalistic investigation into California today. It's part memoir and it's part literary criticism. At one point she goes and she kind of critiques and analyzes her first novel, which she wrote about California in the 1960s, and it's really fascinating. And there are sections of this book that are a little bit dry. I can't pretend that the pieces about California aerospace engineering are fascinating, but I think collectively it creates a really interesting portrait of someone reckoning with their roots. Then we have The Year of Magical Thinking, which is the first Joan Didion book that I ever read, and it's her very famous memoir about the sudden death of her husband of almost 40 years and the year following that traumatic event. This book is so stunning and so specific to Joan Didion's personal experience while also capturing something intensely universal about loss and grief. Towards the beginning of the book, Joan Didion writes, This is my attempt to make sense of the period that followed, 
weeks and then months that cut loose any fixed idea I had ever had about death, about illness, about probability and luck, about good fortune and bad, about marriage and children and memory, about grief, about the ways in which people do and do not deal with the fact that life ends, about the shallowness of sanity, about life itself. This book is very much her working through the inevitability of death, which is an inevitability that we all live with and are aware of, but that we don't necessarily believe until we are in the midst of it. And it really captures, I think, the disorienting quality of death and loss and the ways in which our minds are really not prepared to process death in a sensible or rational way. She talks about not wanting to throw away his shoes because because she still believes, even though she's seen the autopsy and she's seen the obituary, she still believes that he might come back and that he might need his shoes. And in many ways this book utilizes the techniques of her other books in that she very much gathers facts and she processes information and she tries to form a story out of it. But in this book, the subject is her and the subject is her family and the people that she loves. And so it is much more intimate and you get the sense that she's opening this vein publicly, not because she wants to, but because as a writer she has to, and because this is the only way she knows how to try to process and cope with this loss is through writing. The writing is so well crafted and some of the images are so vividly specific that they will stay with you for a long time. She has a second memoir about grief called Blue Nights, and this book is about the death of her daughter Quintana, who died less than two years after her husband. And it's hard after reading The Year of Magical Thinking to think that you could read a more devastating book by Joan Didion, but this is really it. The title of this book refers to the blue nights that occur in New York with the onset of summer, and she says, the blue light is going, the days are already shortening, the summer is gone. This book is called Blue Nights because at the time I began it, I found my mind turning increasingly to illness, to the end of promise, the dwindling of days, the inevitability of the fading, the dying of the brightness. Blue Nights are the opposite of the dying of the brightness, but they are also its warning. In Blue Nights, she looks much more closely at the loneliness of loss. It's about outliving other people and witnessing the end of things. And her sort of affinity for repetition is at its most pronounced in this book. There are images and phrases and bits of writing or conversation that recur again and again and again. And these repeated images and phrases kind of seem to be an echo of everything that she's lost and everything that kind of continues to haunt her throughout this book. She says, for my having a child, there was a season. That season passed. I have not yet located the season in which I do not hear her crooning back to the eight track. I still hear her crooning back to the eight track. The same way I still see the Stephanotis in her braid, the plumeria tattoo through her veil. It's just heartbreaking and something that will lodge itself in you and sit there like a stone. And it's really so good. Those are all the Joan Didion books that I've read. She's fantastic and I really recommend that you check her out. There's also a new documentary about her on Netflix called Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold that I really recommend. That's all I have for you guys today. Go read some Joan Didion. Happy Nonfiction November and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Bye.